So my, um, my goal with this module is to um, give you a brief overview of assessment online and face-to-face -face and, and talk a little bit about the similarities and differences. Um, I think there will be some overlap with some of the things that uh, Meg covered in the previous module. And um, ideally, my module will also um, give you an introduction to some of the issues that you will cover in future modules. Um, so um, without further ado, let me just go to a quick um, overview of what we're, of what we're gonna do. So I'll, I'll start by briefly talking about how language learning happens, uh, just to contextualize uh, what we're gonna talk about. Uh, we will talk about the characteristics of face-to-face -face and online contexts and the similarities and differences between the two. Um, briefly um, remind everyone why we assess and then talk specifically about the three modes of communication um, online and face-to-face -face and assessing each mode. Um, and finally, um, just a couple of ideas of how we can make online assessment more effective and more efficient. So here's a quick overview of, um, of how online and face-to-face -face teaching um, sometimes overlap, but, um, but also differ in many ways. Um, and though I know that many of you teach currently online, but I'm assuming that many of you have also taught face-to-face -face or are probably teaching face-to-face -face and online at the same time. So you're familiar with, with some of these things and I'm sure that you can come up with many other um, characteristics um, of each of the two models. Uh, but basically I would say that um, when we do surveys of students in face-to-face -face, um, courses, and ask them to compare, or in online courses, and ask them to compare their experience, they typically say that the face-to-face -face, um, mode tends to be more, more engaging, um, that they find it easier to, um, to network with other students, other learners, to connect with their teachers. Um, and from the teaching point of view, we also um, find it easier to uh, provide immediate feedback when we are physically there with our students. It's easier to uh, provide support and identify when students need support and provide it and respond to their needs um, on the spot. And it's easier for students to request support when they, when they need it. So um, a face-to-face -face, uh, format has some um, advantages that are due to the nature of face-to-face um, of -face interaction. The online format, on the other hand, has a big advantage of the flexibility, uh, the, the, the ability to access um, materials online 24 seven and to have extended access to your um, peers and unfortunately for us sometimes extended access to your instructors as well. Um, a big advantage of the online medium is that it allows um, the learner to learn at his or her own pace. Um, I know that someone posted a question in the chat a minute ago about fast learners and slow learners. Well, the online medium gives you the, the ability to tailor teaching to the, to the needs of, of different learners. Um, and at the same time, it, it encourages learner responsibility because we are not there to hold the student's hands, um, which is a positive in a way of the face-to-face -face, um, environment, but it can be a negative as well. So the online um, mode encourages more responsibility, more responsibility for learning is on, on the shoulders of the learner. And therefore it requires better discipline. And there's been research that shows that um, success in an online environment requires a certain type of, of learner, that not everyone uh, learns well online. and um, and potentially there's the, the, uh, the problem of isolation. Um, if the online course does not have a very strong uh, component that encourages um, interaction and, and social participation. So like I said, I'm sure that you can think of many other um, pros and cons of each of the two. This is just a, a, a list of some things that come to mind when you try to compare the advantages and disadvantages of each of the two models. So I said that we were gonna look at how 
second language acquisition works and um, probably regardless of the um, of the theory that you espouse theory of second language acquisition that you follow um, almost everyone agrees that input is the key ingredient in second language acquisition that we have to give our learners lots of opportunities to engage with input of a certain type um, if we want acquisition to happen but most theories also agree that input in itself is not enough that students need to have opportunities to produce and uh, and be pushed to produce at a certain level um, again for acquisition to happen and that enough opportunities to interact in the language will result in access to the type of input that students need and the type of opportunities that they need to produce output so those three ingredients are probably uh, according to most theories that the, the most basic in in the process of second language acquisition and the fourth ingredient that i wanted to add is feedback um, in a second language uh, an instructed um, context uh, feedback is crucial learners need to know how they're doing and they need to know what they need to to do to um, fix their their problems if they have them right so that's a basic overview of how language acquisition works and and now what does that mean for teaching well if you think about the three modes of communication you have the interpretive mode that's access to input you have the presentational mode that is uh, a production of output and you have the inter the interpersonal mode which is interaction so the three basic ingredients of second language acquisition are present in our teaching if we focus on the three modes of communication and the idea of feedback is precisely why we assess we assess to to find out where students are and what they need and to uh, give them what they need right so to answer that question again we assess because we need to gather enough evidence of student learning and we assess in a way to give students the ability to answer these three basic questions that come uh, from a from a seminar article that Hattie and Timperley published about a decade ago. The idea is that the evidence that we get from assessing should provide us with information to respond that, that students can use to respond to these three questions. Where am I going? So what are the goals that you as an instructor expect of me? How am I doing? Uh, what progress am I making towards those goals? And where to next, which means what do I need to, to take the next step, to get to the next level, right? So we assess because we want to gather enough evidence to give students information about these three things. Keep that in mind because we'll get back to this a little later. And um, Meg already talked about good assessments, uh, what constitutes a good assessment, so I, I'm not gonna go too much in detail into that, but uh, I know that she mentioned that a good assessment instrument will replicate what happens in the classroom and how it happens. So basically, you have to test, to, to test the way you teach. And a good assessment instrument will also uh, give students the opportunity to demonstrate their ability in a variety of meaningful ways in all skills and will be contextualized. And it will integrate feedback of a variety of types that comes from a variety of sources, right? And this is crucial, again, when we talk, and, and we're gonna go into that in a minute, when we talk about the difference between um, assessing online and assessing face-to-face. -face. The, the, uh, the issue of feedback, what kind of feedback can we provide and, uh, and what types of sources of feedback can we incorporate into our assessment. And finally, um, a quick review of the idea of washback effect, which basically, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, refers to the fact that how you test and what you test has implications for what happens in your teaching. It has implications for what uh, learners expect and, and what they do, both inside and outside the classroom, right? And therefore, 
my, um, if there's one takeaway from this module, it should be that um, we need to think about testing not as an isolated event that happens independently from teaching, but as something that is one and the same, uh, that teaching and testing should be part of the same process. It should be um, almost indistinguishable. And again, we'll go back to this um, a little later. So um, let's look at the three modes of communication, one mode at a time, and, um, and spend some time talking about how assessing each mode face-to-face -face versus online um, uh, differ or are similar and, and what are some of the implications of those differences. So let's start with the interpretive mode. Um, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with the, with the three modes of communication, but in case some of you are not, I'm going to just give a quick overview of each mode at the beginning. So starting with the interpretive mode, the interpretive, so the idea of the three modes of communication is um, if you want a repackaging of the old, the traditional four skills of speaking, writing, listening, and reading. And the idea is that, in fact, those skills are often combined well, depending on how we engage with communication. So for example, in the interpretive mode, Interpretive mode refers to what we do when we are um, individually making sense of input. So when we're listening to something, when we are viewing, uh, when we're reading individually, trying to make sense of the input that we're exposed to. Okay, so that's the interpretive mode. And the interpretive mode the, the, then um, can be reading written sources, or listening to audio sources or viewing audiovisual sources. Okay, so let's talk now about some of the positives and negatives of assessing the interpretive mode in the physical classroom. Some of the differences between the two and, and what can be good and bad about each one. So in the physical classroom, in the in the face-to-face -face classroom, um, when we test the interpretive mode, when we assess the interpretive mode, one of the um, positives is that we are there to identify to and respond to difficulties immediately. Someone asked um, earlier what happens when, you, when, when the students have problems with the technology, right, and they're not there to solve them. Um, so that's, a, that's an advantage of the, of the physical classroom. You are there to solve them. So I give my students a test on a reading, and if they don't understand what the questions are asking them to do, I'm there to solve the problem. So that's a, that's a plus. And I'm there to provide immediate feedback. I give them the, the, the assessment, they complete it. Immediately after that, I can give them feedback about their um, performance. So that's another positive of the face-to-face -face classroom. The biggest negative, of course, is that it takes up a tremendous amount of classroom time that is used for individual work. So students are individually reading or listening to something and then responding to questions about the input, doing individual work. And in a communicative classroom where the, where the emphasis is on communication and exchange of information and interaction, we don't want to use up um, all that time doing individual work. So that's a negative when we assess the interpretive mode in the physical classroom. Another one is that it is difficult to personalize. Going back to the idea of fast learners versus slow learners that came up earlier, um, this is a, a, a problem when we're assessing interpretive mode in the classroom because you have students who are fast learners and say you, you're giving them um, an audio clip to listen to and then um, respond uh, to some comprehension questions. You have the fast learner that needs to listen to the audio clip once and is ready to answer every question. And then you have the slower learners that need to listen to it two or three times. So what do you do? Do you play it only once and then half of the class is gonna get frustrated? Or do you play it three times and half of the class is gonna get bored? So, you know, that's, that, that, that lack of flexibility is obviously a limitation for the for the face-to-face -face, um, environment. When we look at the same thing online, at assessing interpretive communication 
online, um, one of the negatives is that, as we said, if students have difficulties with the task, we're not there um, immediately to, to troubleshoot. That is a limitation, but not an absolute negative, because that, what that means is that we have to put a lot of work up front to anticipate every possible problem before we create the assessment. Um, and I think Meg mentioned that. Um, I, I actually went through that yesterday when I was preparing an assessment for, for a class that is gonna be online on Friday. And I spent a significant amount of time going over everything. I assigned the test to myself. I took the test to make sure that everything was clear, that everything worked the way, the way I wanted it to work. So, you know, that is a, a difficulty. It can be solved. A big advantage is that students control their time of exposure. And as we said earlier, if, if they want to listen to an audio clip four times, they can. If they want to spend extra time reading a text where they have to answer some questions, they can. So that's a big um, advantage, the flexibility. Um, another advantage is that um, on comprehension uh, types of assessment, um, some of the grading, if you do it online, can be done automatically. So it saves you time. And some of the feedback can be generic feedback that can be done automatically as well. So it saves you time. Um, of course, if you want to provide personalized feedback, you're not there to provide immediately. So that's, that's not, that, that may be a, a, a limitation. Um, what's nice about um, teaching online in the 21st century is that um, building interpretive communication assessments online is fairly easy. There are lots of tools that you can use um, to do it. Um, I created a quick uh, quiz using Google Forms um, just yesterday to give you an idea of how this can be done. Someone mentioned Google Forms a minute ago. I'm, assu I'm assuming most of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, let me show you what it looks like. Um, I may have to change what I'm sharing. Give me just a minute. Okay. Can someone confirm that you're seeing the, the quiz? Yes, yes, we can see the okay, great. B B great. Show. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, it's just a test um, uh, that I created yesterday. So it's a, a recipe. Um, it's actually a, a commercial um, that I got from YouTube. I uploaded it here. I created a couple of uh, multiple choice questions here. I assigned them one point each. I created another one that's short answer, open-ended uh, for two points. Uh, you can create as many as you want. You can um, uh, include um, automatic feedback if you want. Um, you just need to share the link with the students. They click on the link, they take the quiz, they enter their email here, and they click submit at the bottom and it goes to you. So fairly easy to design and, um, and uh, um, fairly easy to get the, um, the results of the students immediately. Okay, I'm trying to change my, can you, uh, are, you are we back to the PowerPoint? Can you please confirm? We're back to the PowerPoint, yes. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so um, I, included the a link there that you can go to um, once you have access to the PowerPoint, which you will, um, if, if you are not familiar with how to use Google Forms to create quizzes, okay? So that's a quick overview of um, testing, assessing the interpretive mode, both online and face-to-face, -face, some of the pros and the cons of each of the, of, of the two modes. Let's talk about the interpersonal mode now. Um, again, for those of you who are not familiar with the modes, the interpersonal mode is what happens when we um, exchange, it's a synchronous communication, typically synchronous communication in which there's exchange of information. So when we're having a conversation face-to-face -face with someone or, or, or over the phone, um, that's interpersonal. Um, when we are text messaging with someone, that's interpersonal. Um, some people would argue that uh, emailing is a form of interpersonal mode, although it really is um, in between interpersonal and presentational. But uh, you get the idea. That's the interpersonal mode. And um, as such, the interpersonal mode can imply speaking and listening or writing and reading. Okay. So 
again, let's look at the two um, formats, face-to-face -face and online, and some of the characteristics of assessments, interpersonal assessments in each format. So face-to-face, -face, um, a lot of people, when, when, when you talk about language courses, um, the main reason why people are sometimes reluctant to teach languages online is because they think the opportunities for interpersonal communication are very limited. And it is true that in the face-to-face -face format, um, it is easier to create natural opportunities to, to engage in synchronous interaction. It's easier, it's more natural, you're there. Um, it, it doesn't take much for the teacher to say, okay, now in pairs, you're gonna have a conversation about X. Okay? It's a lot easier to do that than it would be to replicate that in an online environment. Um, it's also true that when the teacher is there, um, you can provide immediate feedback um, when the students are having synchronous face-to-face -face communication with other students. They have immediate feedback from their interlocutors and they can use our feedback or their peers' feedback to modify their output, which as we said in the beginning is one of the key ingredients in second language acquisition. So, so they have an opportunity to get exposed to input, to produce output, to get feedback, modify their output, et cetera. So those are big advantages of the face-to-face -face, uh, context. But a big disadvantage is that and those of you who teach face-to-face -face or have taught face-to-face -face know about this, it's impossible to attend to all students. I mean, if you're very lucky to have a class of 20, and many of us have many more than 20 students in, a, in our rooms, if you have a class of 20 and you put them in pairs and you have 10 conversations going on at the same time, you can't listen to every single conversation. You may be able to listen to a few seconds of every, every conversation, but that's really not, I mean, that's not gonna help you uh, get an idea it's not gonna help you assess your student's ability to use the interpersonal mode of communication. Um, and when you want to provide feedback to students in the interpersonal mode in the classroom, that feedback tends to be very unsystematic because, you know, again, going back to the example before, a, there are conversations going on in the classroom. And you want to listen to a conversation and you hear something and you want to provide feedback. What do you do? Do you stop the conversation and tell the student, this is not how you do it. There was a problem there. You need to fix it. And then you stop the flow of communication, which is less than ideal. Or do you wait till they're done with their conversation and then you say, remember five minutes ago when you asked that question? Well, the word order was wrong. You need to fix that. That's not going to be effective either. So that's a big problem in the face-to-face -face context. And of course, remember that interpersonal communication can be um, speaking and listening or writing and reading. So when you create speaking and listening opportunities in the classroom, that's a very natural um, context to do it. But if you want to create a, an activity where you assess your student's ability to engage in written interpersonal communication, the classroom is not the most natural environment to do that, right? So if you say you have to send a text message to your classmate and you know using uh, um, messaging, a messaging app, you need to agree on something. Not the best um, way to do it in the classroom, right? So it can be good and bad. Let's look at it online now. So, one of the big advantages of the online mode is that anything that happens online can be recorded and archived. And that allows you to, when we're talking about interpersonal communication, it allows you to provide, to provide delayed but very specific feedback. So going back to the conversation before, to the example of the conversation, you don't have to wait till the end of the conversation and then give your students feedback. You can wait and then say, Go back to the recording and at one minute and 25 seconds, you asked a question, there was something wrong with it. Let's see if you can figure out what it was and fix it, right? So you can do that. And of course you can pay attention to every student, not that you would want to, but you can listen to every single conversation that, that your students recorded and provide feedback. 
which and 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 by doing that by using that delayed opportunity to provide feedback you avoid the problem of, of disrupting communication so the big problems that we mentioned in the face-to-face -face mode can be addressed and solved in the online context it is true that interaction mediated by technology is less natural, although it's becoming more and more natural, more and more common, but it is less natural than face-to-face -face communication. You lose some things, you lose you know, um, gestures and, and other things that contribute to, to uh, the communicative goals. And if it is asynchronous, because you can also um, uh, assess um, interpersonal communication, spoken interpersonal communication in a synchronous way online. Um, but if it is asynchronous, then it is not really interpersonal in the sense that interpersonal communication should happen in real time, which is a negative, but at least is a good um, way to practice interpersonal abilities because students have planning time. So if you have students engage in a conversation in which I have to record a question, and then you go online, listen to my question and record your answer, and then I go online and listen to your answer and say something else. It's not a real, real-time conversation, but it has the advantage that it adds planning time, which is um, a good stepping stone, a good um, support to, um, to prepare students to be able to communicate in more natural conversations. To me, um, the, the, the top ones that I just circled with the red circle are the big, um, the big advantages, the, the, the crucial advantages of the online context over face-to-face, over -face, and we must exploit those. Um, and we'll go back to that in a minute. Um, another big advantage is that there are many um, ways in which these conversations can be recorded and archived now. Um, Many of you are familiar with Hangout, and I've included here a link to um, explanations on how to create a Hangout on air in case you haven't used it. So once you have access to the PowerPoint, you'll be able to, to see that. And the third mode of communication, the presentational mode. Again, I wanted to, I just want to give a quick introduction to the presentational mode. This is what happens when you are, it's a one to many type of communication. So what I'm doing right now is an example of the presentational mode. If you uh, create a poster that you show to the rest of the class, that's an example of the presentational mode. Typically, it involves speaking or writing and sometimes showing as well. Um, so in, this, in my case right now, I'm using speaking and writing because um, you are engaging with, uh, with, uh, with both uh, written text and oral text. So what happens when we assess the presentational mode face-to-face? -face? Well, and this would be, you know, the traditional stand up in front of the class and do a five minute presentation that we've all seen and often used in our classrooms. So when that happens in, a, in an online, in a face-to-face -face context, students are really exposed to a more realistic presentational context that, that replicates what, what would happen uh, when they have an audience in front of them. Um, and it typically results in high levels of anxiety. And so the advantage of doing that is, is that students have to learn to deal with, uh, with anxiety when using a second language, which is not an easy task. So it's good practice for them. We can also make sure that students are not cheating. I don't know about you, but um, often when I've assigned presentations online, I'm not so sure that students are not reading um, rather than speaking, and that's not what I want. Um, if you're right there, face to face in the classroom, you can be sure that they're not reading from notes, that they're actually presenting orally. So that's an advantage of the face to face context. The biggest disadvantage is that, you know, if you've, if you've done these presentations in class and you have a few students, it gets to be very, very, boring for both for the students and for the instructor to have to listen to 10 or 15 presentations one after the other. And it's really a waste of precious time. Going back to what, what I said earlier, um, in a communicative classroom, you want to spend as much time as you can 
communicating um, hopefully in an interpersonal way and you don't want to use much time doing individual stuff that that um, doesn't require interlocutors right so that's a that's a big um, uh, minus for the face-to-face -face context now when you think about it online again the ability to record and archive and the ability that that uh, gives us to provide delayed feedback and specific feedback is a plus um, in a in a face-to-face -face presentation of course you can provide feedback at the end of the presentation you don't want to stop the presentation and say say to someone that's not how you say it uh, you wait till the end and you provide generic uh, feedback if the presentation is recorded you can again go back to the specific point in the recording where there was a problem pointed out and ask the student to figure it out and solve it and, and fix it um, a big advantage is that when you uh, record and make available uh, presentations you can set up a system where students self-assess and peer review um, and particularly self-assess because you can you can do peer review with face-to-face um, -face presentations but self-assessment of a face-to-face -face presentation is not possible it is much more likely to happen and be effective when you do it online um, something that may be good or bad as i said earlier is the idea of uh, anxiety levels if you have students that get anxious in front of a crowd the opportunity to record a presentation and post it online um, which will reduce significantly their levels of anxiety is a good thing um, but again it, it may be good for them to learn how to handle increased levels of anxiety and again, another big plus now that we're in the 21st century is that there are lots of tools available that you can use, that students can use to produce um, highly uh, professional, almost professional uh, quality presentations. Uh, PowerPoint is one, Prezi, YouTube, Sway, Vimeo, et cetera. I'm sure that you're all familiar with uh, all of these or many of these. In case you're not, I have added another um, link there to voice thread and uh, and an idea on, or suggestions on how to use voice thread um, for the presentational mode um, i wanted to talk about the elephant in the room um, and the elephant in the room when we talk about assessing online is uh, cheating how do you address cheating right uh, i said earlier you know you, you want to assess presentational communication you ask your students to record a presentation how do you know that they're not um, reading or you uh, you want to assess um, interpretive communication how do you know that they're not using other sources well i wanted to go back to what i said at the beginning test the way you teach keep that in mind um, and think about formative versus summative assessment think about assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning so think about everything that happens in your online course if you're teaching an online course as an opportunity to assess as an opportunity to gather evidence about student learning and as an opportunity to provide students with feedback about their learning so again responding to those three questions that i mentioned at the beginning how am i doing where am i going how am i doing and what do i need to do next think about your teaching as your testing they're both the same thing. They should be the same thing, teaching and assessing. So if you're testing this way, I, went, I did a quick Google search and I came up with this um, Spanish exam. If you're testing this way, right, where students have to fill out a sentence with the uh, right word or choose from a list of possible words and select singular or masculine or feminine or plural or whatever, um, it doesn't really matter if you say to your students this is a communicative classroom and and the emphasis is on communication and getting you to that is not going to mean anything if this is how you teach and if this is how you teach then you'll make it fairly easy for students to, to cheat if you do this type of testing online so that's a big no-no again think about teaching and assessing as the same process gathering evidence of student learning so I wanted to um, 
in, in this in the last uh, segment, last few minutes, um, I wanted to talk about ways in which we can make online assessment more effective and more efficient. We've said that there are certain benefits of assessing online, particularly we've talked about the ability to provide good feedback, effective feedback, individualized feedback, but it, all of that takes takes up a tremendous amount of time for, for the instructor to, to be able to take advantage of those opportunities, um, particularly when we're assessing the productive modes, presentational and interpersonal. When, when we want to assess our students' ability to produce the language, that takes a significant amount of time. So how can we do it effectively and efficiently? I suggest that we focus on rubrics, models, and feedback, those three things. So let me talk about that. We, knew, we need good models, we need good rubrics, and we need lots of feedback. The models will allow us or allow the students to understand where they're going. The rubrics will allow them to know how they're doing, and the feedback will allow them to know what they need to do next. Okay? And think about using these, um, these three tools, models, rubrics, and feedback, in a cyclical way, following a cyclical approach. Um, one of the challenges of assessment online is that because we can do many things that we can't do face-to-face, -face, and again, specifically feedback on everything and for everyone, we either try to do it, to do everything, and we become overwhelmed and overworked, or we not do everything that we can and we feel, we feel like we're missing the opportunity. So again, following the assumption that we want to use assessment as an opportunity for learning, a model like this makes perfect sense. And the idea would be that we create user-friendly rubrics every time we want to assess our students. We then give our students models of the performance that we expect and teach them how to apply the rubric to those models. Then we give them the opportunity to practice applying that rubric to samples of performance. Once they're comfortable, once they have internalized the rubric and what it means and they're comfortable using it, we have them perform. That's when we give them the, 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 the assessment. We have them perform. And then we have them apply the rubrics to their own performance and to their peers' performance and provide feedback, right? So we start with a good model. This is what, it, what the ideal performance in this assessment looks like. This is the rubric that I'm going to um, apply to that uh, performance. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to practice with that rubric. Once you're ready, I'm gonna ask you to perform and show me that you can do that. And I'm gonna ask you to apply the rubric to your own performance and provide yourself with feedback and provide your peers with, with feedback, okay? And what this is gonna do is it's going to make our job a lot easier because now we're not the only ones in the room that are responsible for, in the room or the virtual room, that are responsible for the feedback process and, and the assessment process. We're sharing it with the students. Let me give you an example of what I mean. This is an intermediate level rubric that I created fairly quickly. Um, it's user friendly, as I said earlier, it needs to be a rubric that students understand. Um, it's simple, user friendly. It has four categories divided into two. One subcategory would be meet and the other does not meet. Does it meet the intermediate level um, um, criteria or doesn't it meet th those criteria? If it doesn't meet, is there no evidence of the criteria or some evidence? If it meets, is there minimal evidence or is there full evidence? Okay, so this is something that's fairly easy to explain to students how to use, how it works. Then you give learners opportunities to internalize the rubric so that, become, that they become experts at understanding um, what you're talking about and assessing themselves. So you give them a model, for example, give them a, an example of a conversation at the intermediate level that meets all those criteria and explain to them how you see that model meeting the criteria. So that you make it explicit. 
you know, here's an example of how it, uh, the, the speaker is able to maintain a closer conversation. Here's an example of how uh, he or she is able to ask a variety of questions, right? So you explain to students how to work with the criteria. Then you give them another example and, and you ask them to determine whether or not it meets the criteria and what criteria it meets. Okay, so again, you have them practice with the rubric. And when they're ready, when they've had enough uh, practice with it, when they've internalized the criteria for the rubric, that's when you ask them to perform. So you create a task. So in this case, working with a partner, they have to do an information gap activity and record their interaction. They have to watch their performance and rate themselves using the rubric. And then they have to watch two other role plays of, of their classmates and, um, and assess themselves using the same rubric and provide feedback. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to do, to take advantage of the affordances of the online medium, in this case, the ability to provide feedback on everything at any time, but outsource the, the, the uh, production of feedback. Um, train the students to be to share that responsibility with you so that you're not the only one um, uh, responsible for assessing their, their performance and providing feedback. And this, as I said, um, can make our assessment of particularly the interpersonal and the presentational modes much more effective and more efficient. The example that I gave you is an interpersonal task, but the same model can be applied easily to the to the presentational task as well. And I think um, I'm going to stop right there because I know that we're running a little late and we need to um, save some time for questions. So if that's okay, I'll stop it right there and I'll, um, I'll uh, take questions. I haven't been paying attention to the chat, so I don't know what uh, came in.